on the screen savers, sexy secrets of MP3 players, Photoshop guru reveals all, and download a $7,500 graphics program for free. Live from my basement in San Francisco, it's the screen savers. Welcome to the Screen Savers. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Leo Laporte. We thank you so much for joining us on this. This is going to be such a great show. It's going to be an out of control show. This is the place where you get your toughest computer questions answered. You yeah. meet some of the people on the forefront of the digital revolution. The uh, paper cut bleeding edge, if you will. <laughs> oh, wow. Well. Coming up in today's show, Wayfront's Andrew Pierce demonstrates tips and tricks for a free downloadable version of Maya. We're kind of going to get you started. We, now that you can get Maya for free yeah. for the Mac, we're going to show you what it is and how to use it. I'm even more excited about this. Burt Monroy is here. First time anywhere ever on national television, you're going to see the new Photoshop 7.0. They announced it earlier this week. It won't be available in stores for another month. We're going to show it to you here first. And we're going to talk about how to build a standalone MP3 player. You can bolt onto your home stereo, leave in the backyard. You know what? They said 400. I'm going to tell you under 20 bucks. Now, how much would you pay? 15 bucks. Can you get to zero, sir? As a matter of fact, I have one that costs zero. Does it involve spoons? It doesn't even involve stealing. <laughs> okay. First, let's toss it over to our high-tech nook, Martin Sergeant Megan Maroney. What do you got for us today, kids? Well, today I'm going to show you a download that will blow your mind. No. It'll blow your mind. If you think you like the Google toolbar, I mean, think again because this is good. Best thing since Atari. Dude. Heard it here first. And we're going to round out uh, Black History Month with five online resources geared towards Black Geeks. And then in the sight of the night, we'll be talking about skin flicks. That's Woo! right. Uh, movie reviews written by a dermatologist. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <That's it. laughs> I just have to say this. Dude, you're getting Adele. I'm sorry. Thank you, Megan and Martin. Let's begin by taking a look at the top technology-related stories of the day. I think you can't you do this with one. Adele. Can't do that with it though? No, not that. This. You can't steal software with your iPod. Ah. They, but this is a Wired Magazine picked this up. Uh, a customer at a Dallas Comp USA store, right. standing in the store watching. He's looking, there's a teenager doing something kind of funny over on mm -hmm. the Mac counter. He's got his iPod, that little Macintosh uh, based MP3 player. Sure. It's basically a, a five gigabyte portable hard drive plugged in to one of the Macs. The guy looks over the shoulder and he sees the kid is copying Microsoft Office. Onto the iPod. That's, that's a $500 program. In case and the truth is, if you think about it, because the iPod is just a portable hard drive, sure. if you've got a FireWire cable, you could walk up to any Mac and within a matter of minutes copy software off that Mac. Very easy to do. In fact, I was going to show you how to do it. I was going to show you how to steal Photoshop 7 from Burt Monroy's computer. But they told me I couldn't. <laughs> Oddly enough, Microsoft Office, despite all the copy protection on the Windows side, right. on Microsoft Office on the Mac, it's just one folder. If you copy that folder and copy it on another computer and run it, but Microsoft Office obligingly reinstalls itself on your new computer. It says, oh, you've never run me before. Let me just put things where they belong. Oh, dear. And it sets itself up. Oh, but that's going to change in the next version of Office. Well, there is a little thing. It goes out in the network and looks for the serial number, uh, and then police arrive at your door. But that's not... That's, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. They have ways of making you buy software. The yeah. Well, you know, the world's first video game, video gaming, is 40 years old. New York Times reporting Jiminy. John Glenn made this nation's first man over the flight and researchers at MIT developed the world's first video game. Coincidence? I think not. not. The game was called Space War. Oh, yeah. It consisted of two small green spaceships revolving there around a green sun. Looks like asteroids, doesn't it? Yeah. Space War was designed to take advantage of the PDP-1 mini computer, that hot little item that would fill your living room, and the brand new cathode ray display. Hyperspace. Isn't that cool? Scary, actually. The game influenced Nolan Bushnell, who, of course, played it as an engineering graduate student, as well as the teenage boys. Jobs and Wozniak went on to start Apple. The Times says they used to ride their bikes to the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab where they could play the game. Aww. Isn't that sweet? It's, it's very cool. Yeah. And it really, you can see how Asteroids and other more recent games What's came out. Was it like a $16 came out billion dollar a year industry now? You have caller ID? No. On your, I have it on my cell phone. You must have it on your cell phone. Sure. I have it on my home phone. I love that because then you can see who's calling. Except for all your friends that have restricted IDs. Well, I don't answer that. Sorry. According to the Associated Press, a woman in western New York who has caller ID sees the names of dead people on her caller ID box. 
Nancy Crocker called her local phone company to report that according to her caller ID, she'd received calls from George Washington, Charles Dickens, I'm waiting for Charles Dickens, and Abraham Lincoln, and, and Albert Einstein. He said, hello, is you there? Hello? I think somebody's been hacking the caller ID. Is you there, box. Charlie? The phone company said the names were made up as part of a testing system and a power failure probably caused dead people to show up on her device. Is that wild? That's odd. Unconvinced she's been spending most of her time at home trying to star 69 back to the 18th century. No <laughs> luck yet, but we'll tell you the minute it works. Actually, for a long time on caller ID, I was. If I called you on my cell yeah. phone, I was a guy named Mark Szymanski. Mark Szymanski. In fact, no, I'm not kidding. And I, I called my wife yesterday, I swear, I swear this is the truth, and she screamed. And I said, what's the matter? What's the matter? She said, you're Leo Laporte. I said, yes. She said, all this time I thought you were Mark Szymanski. Now that's scary. I'm really worried now. No, seriously. Anyway, that's enough of that. Uh, Our question of the day, Mr. Norton. Have you changed your position on music piracy? Yes or no? You got 24 hours to vote. We're going to talk more about this poll question today. And, and why some people on. have. Really? And uh, maybe not in the direction you're thinking. Dun dun dun. dun. Details to come. Yeah. But first, a live call. A real person. Randy. Unlike us. Joins us on the Intel Tech TV Net Cam Network from Peoria, Illinois. How you doing tonight, Randy? Hey, guys. Wonderful. I'm just peachy tonight. Excellent. God, so good to talk to you. Oh, great. It's great to talk to you yeah, guys. Yeah, well, what can we do for you? Listen, I got um, a configuration kind of a problem. It ain't really a problem. I just want your opinion, really. On a, um, I got a real fast hard drive. Yeah. I got a 24-speed CD, uh, CD writer. Okay. And a 50-speed CD-ROM. And I got an internal 250 zip drive. All right. So you now, got... naturally, I'm going to put the hard drive as the master on the IDE-1. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the configuration that would you go under that as slave, master, slave, again? So you got three IDE devices. Can I ask you first, though, is that a NASA hat you're wearing? Yeah, that's a NASA. Are, are you an astronaut, sir? No, no. My son plays jazz bass, and uh, he went to uh, Kennedy down there in Florida last year, and he brought me the hat back. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Does he play jazz bass on the shuttle? No, he played with a little jazz group, and they made their way down through the Bahamas playing gigs on boats and when he come back uh, oh, he stopped cool. there and went to the Space Kennedy, one, one, uh, Kennedy one more Space question. Center. Does it say Mark Szymanski now on your caller ID? <laughs> Never mind. I'm sorry. Forget no, I said no, that. It I'm sorry. I'm going to be completely serious now. Okay. okay. And Patrick will help you. <laughs> Patrick, I, yeah, I get to help you. First thing is, I almost want to tell you to throw away the Zip 250. Normally, what you do I'd is love you, to. you put your hard drives on the first channel, and you put your CD-ROM drives on your second channel. You never mix a hard drive and a CD-ROM drive. Why is that, Mr. N? Well, if you must know, yes. if, you put a, if you put your fast hard drive in any of the CD-ROM drives on the same IDE channel, uh, like you put like the hard drive master, the CD-ROM drive slave, the CD-ROM drive is actually going to slow down that hard drive. It's even if bad. it's a, even if as most uh, CD-ROMs now are, UDMA 33 or 66, it's still going to be slower than the hard drive. That's the rumor. Now, so here's a question. So you, okay, he's going to put his hard drive and have its mm -hmm. own chain. You know, you got, you got really four IDE devices in a PC, two on one on chain ID0 and two on ID1. So he's going to have a hard drive all by itself on ID0. Sure. Let's say he's going to keep the zip or maybe he wants to add a CDRW. Does it matter? on the second chain if you put those two together? The, putting those two together in the second chain should not be a problem. Okay. It might get a little sketchy if you want to copy stuff from the 250 onto the CDR, but to be honest with you, if the system sounds fast enough, you probably, how much memory is in that system? I got 384 megs of RAM I right now. I don't think You're it's going to be an issue. <laughs> Sometimes you see with burning software, if you have a CD and a CDRW on the same IDE chain, they'll say, oh, you're going to have a problem with interleaving yeah. reads and writes. Right. Well, my burning software does bark that at yeah. me when it was on the same IDE, but I switched them over. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more important that you have a hard drive on its own chain than, the, right. the, than that you share with the CDs. And the truth is, if it works okay, you know, try it. It's barking at you, but if it works okay, try if it, and yeah, then just yeah, ignore the barking. The other, I have it that way, and it doesn't bother me. If it does bother you, if it does create problems, you can go out, you can buy a PCI, even an AT1, AT100, AT66 sure. card, probably 18 to $25 online or at your local computer store. Plug that into an open PCI slot, put whatever you want on that second set. IDE is so cheap, and it's so you know, omnipresent, yeah. um, it's too bad because you know, these are problems you don't have with, say, firewire drives or drives or that SCSI. are, or SCSI drives. Well, there are other issues with SCSI drives, but you don't have that same right. kind of problem. Uh, any kind of a channel where it's bus mastered and, and, and mm -hmm. each device is kind of more independent. Unfortunately, the devices do if, impact each other if they're on the same it's chain. It's like juggling hockey players. 
never tried that. <laughs> and I don't think I will. Thank you for the call. We appreciate it. Hope that helps. Oh, boy. To ask your question on the air, give us a call on the telephone, 888-989-7879. Would they uh, be a National Hockey League, NHL? They're all dangerous to juggle. Okay. College? Yeah. Send us a fax, 415 <laughs> Do they take their skates off first? No, that's the problem. 5869, that's the uh, fax lion. You can also chat with us. We have a chat room. It's hot. It's happening. Kevin's in there. Right? Yeah. F yeah. <laughs> chat with us, techtv.com <laughs> slash chat. Now. now what happens if they get on? If you get on, you know what, if you appear on the show with a net cam, you get a magnetic picture frame and either a t-shirt or a hat. And this, well, today's, our fridge picture features a long-awaited matrix screen Oh, saver. this is so cool. Photoshop picture. I made that my yeah. desktop. That's you in front. You're Ooh. Neo. I get to be that other guy who's kind of in the back. Morpheus. Yoshi, who are you being? Are you the... Who's, who's Yoshi? <laughs> and, and, of course, we, everyone knows... That's not Yoshi? No, Martin. That's oh, that's Martin. Martin. Sorry. That's me, not Josh. And that's Trinity is, of course, the lovely and talented Megan Maroney. Woohoo! Wow, I like that. Can we, are we going to make that available? We should make that available because that's a really nice... Can we put that on the website or is that a yeah, horrible violation of copy? Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> okay, After the break, report for base computer training in Leo's boot camp when the screensavers continue. Yeah. Yeah. I thought Megan was going to say something. Hi, welcome to boot camp, ladies and gentlemen. That scared me. I'm Leo Laporte. This is the place where we answer your basic computer questions. And as always, we like to plug my book. No, I'm sorry. We'd like to start off with a tip. That was a Freudian slip. And plug my book. The tip, as usual, from poor Leo's 2002 Computer Almanac and fine bookstores everywhere. The tip is something everybody should know about who uses Windows. And it's just regular disk maintenance and you may not know to do it. And it doesn't do it for you automatically. What you should do, just double click my computer and open it. Now I'm doing this in Windows XP, but it's very similar in all versions of Windows. If you right click on your hard drive, if you have more than one, you should do it on each of them, and select Properties. The little Properties window that's gonna pop up here has a Tools tab. And these are the tools of our lives. Doom, doom. This is the one you want to do on a, probably a weekly basis, is error checking. You may know it as scan disk. You should do this frequently because if your hard drive is going to fail, you're going to want to uh, have a little early warning. Now, do you need to uh, scan for an attempt recovery of bad sectors? Probably not weekly because that's a lot slower. You might try that every few months, every month or so. You certainly should have this automatic and just do this. This is going to take a few minutes to scan those disks and it is a very good idea to make sure your disks are healthy. It'll check to see that the catalogs are properly ordered, that, you know, things like uh, there isn't one entry for, uh, two entries for the same file, or that two files are pointing at the same space on the hard drive, things like that. That's scan disk. Run that again about every week. Important to do that. The other tool, if I can get this out of the way, yes, thank you, my disk check is complete, is defragmentation. Now, I've always said you don't need to do this weekly or even monthly. If you're doing a lot of video editing, anything where you're writing large files to the hard drive and the speed of the writing is important, you might want to do this even daily. But if you're just a normal user that's not doing a lot of special stuff, you're just doing uh, you know, word processing, that kind of thing, it's enough to do this quarterly, every few months. What it does is reorganizes your hard drive to put it in order so that all the files that belong in one place are all in one place. It saves time. The hard drive doesn't have to go seeking all over, the, all over itself to find information. So right now it's analyzing my system. It's going to show how fragmented it is, and then I can reorganize it. Uh, the tools look a little different. And let's see here. Let's, let's view our report. Yeah, see, we haven't done it. It says you should defragment this volume. You can, you can view a little report that will tell you how messed up it is, how disorganized it is. And uh, you see it's, it's quite disorganized. About 14% of the space is, is uh, messed up, and 28% of the, vo of the, vo of the uh, files are spread out over the drive in more than one place. To speed up our system, we just run defragment right now. A good thing to do. Uh, at least every three months, maybe more, if you use your hard drive and really kind of work it. Two tools everybody's got, everybody should use in Microsoft Windows. That's our tip of the day from Poor Leo's 2002 Computer Almanac. Let's say hi to Tom. Our, our boot camp caller on the Intel Tech TV Netcam Network, 
from Rhinelander, Wisconsin. Hi, Tom. Hi, Leo. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Great. How are things in Rhinelander? What's that in back of you? Wait a minute. You got something going on in back of you there? Uh, that's probably my Christmas tree light that I never took down Christmas yet. Christmas <laughs> trees. Let me think. Wait a minute. It's March 1st tomorrow. Oh, you're the you're the kind of guy that leaves Christmas. It's Christmas year round. Yeah, and not that it's pretty good night light. <laughs> sure it is. Is it? It's not a real tree. No. It's no. Just hanging from the wall. Just hanging from the wall. Okay. So it's. I feel festive. I don't know about you. Maybe I can give you a gift for this holiday season. That'd be okay. Do good. you take it down before St. Patrick's Day? I'm just curious. Yeah, I'll okay. take it down. <laughs> Who's that behind you now? Now see, Ed, there's a lot going on uh, in there. That's my girlfriend. Hi, girlfriend. <laughs> girlfriend have a name? Yeah, her name's Shelly. She likes Christmas too, huh? Uh, yeah. Okay. What can we do for you, Tom and Sally? Uh, my question is, uh, I would like to know how I could boot my or boost up my um, video cam. You, you mean like what you're doing right now? Yeah. I li actually, the picture's not bad. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons I brought up all that stuff going on in the background is, in fact, we could see it. A okay. lot of times on these net cams, you, all you see is, but we could actually see that you had Christmas lights behind you. I could see Sally behind you. So it's not bad. You've got to understand, you're using net meeting? Yeah. Yeah, let me turn my net meeting on. In fact, I've got a camera here. I'm going to get the picture. You've got to understand that the picture you get now, this is the local picture, okay. is going to be a whole lot better than the one that's going to go out on the Internet. All right. Uh, the reason is there's nothing there's nothing slowing this picture down. I mean, it's just except me. There you go. Oh, that's really uh, very flattering. <laughs> there's nothing slowing this picture down. It's coming right off the computer. As soon as we send it on the internet, the network traffic can mess it up. It's sent out in little packets, little bits and pieces. I'm just going to leave it like that, pointing at the ceiling. It's set off in little bits. Hey, you know what? I'm going to point it at you, Mark, because you are one good-looking guy. There you go. That's my floor director. Isn't he handsome? So uh, they, you got to understand that uh, it's going out in bits and pieces that can get spread out. You drop one little packet, there's going to be a blip in there. Uh, and the other thing is, of course, the compression has to be very high to get it out on the Internet. So it recompresses. This is an un relatively uncompressed. It recompresses it again before it goes out on the Internet, and that's where you get a lot of the distortion. So let me show you a few settings. They're not going to they're not going to transform it, Tom, but I'll show you what they mean anyway. If you go to Tools and you go to Options, you're going to see in a moment an options window pop up. I think I broke it. There we go. And I'm going to click on the video options. Here's a few things you can set. This is the one that makes the most difference right here is video quality. Now, setting it to better quality doesn't mean you're going to get better quality. Isn't that odd? What this really should say is frame rate. And it's going to be a fast, it's going to be a higher frame rate. But the quality, it may, may only get a frame a second or every three seconds, depending on your speed. You really have to play with this. I would start in the middle. Better quality often here often means worse sound quality. So there's a definite trade-off. If you set it all the way down here, your frame rate will be lower, but the quality of the pictures might be higher. Does that make sense to you? Do you understand what the trade-off is, Tom? We have a lot of data we're sending down the pipe, including audio, and pictures. The number of frames per second impacts the quality of the picture in the frame. Personally, I want to hear, number one, I want to hear sound. If you're talking with somebody on a net cam, your girlfriend's, uh, you know, moves back east or something, and you want to talk to her on the net cam, you got to hear her first. So I always say you got to get the sound good and then get the picture as, as good as you can without ruining the sound. And that means slowly moving it over. The best sound is with faster video. Slowly moving it over till you get the sound doesn't, you know, decrease, quality doesn't increase, and the video quality is as good as it can be. You'll also notice this image size here. A smaller image is easier to send, right? Less data. We don't have to compress it as much. We can get more frames per second. So small sometimes is a good idea. Certainly, there's gonna, it's going to impact the quality as you get bigger. So those are the, really the only two things you can set. A faster pipe uh, works better. Use it when it's not a busy time on the internet. The more traffic that's going on on the internet, the more likely you're going to drop packets, get some dropout, get some frame rate slowdown. So all of those things can impact it. The one you can really control is in here in these settings. Okay? Hey, thank you, Tom and Sally. I appreciate it. It's good to talk to you. And happy holidays. Coming up next, Megan searches for the right tool for the job. Right here, right now, right here, right now, when the screensavers continues. To change the cursor blink rate, open the control panel, select keyboard, and slide the bar to blink to the beat of your own inner drum.
Do you know Sarah Lane? I do. She's the screensaver's sassiest producer, a legend in her own time, and a major pain in my ram. Go to thescreensavers.com to read her article about some guy named David Lynch, who it turns out is going to be appearing on our show next week. Sarah goes on and on and on about this Lynch character and his TV series Twin Peaks and his movies Blue Velvet and Mulholland Drive. It's all at thescreensavers.com where you'll also get Sarah Lane's email address. Send her a message and she might just give you her autograph. I got one. Now the fabulous <laughs> duo, Megan and Pat. Do you know we're a duo now? <laughs> we are a duo. We're a dynamic duo. All right, Nicole from Chicago sent me a download that literally blows the Google toolbar out of the water. You know the Google toolbar, right? It mm -hmm. lets you search Google sure. and search within a site, search Google within a site straight from the toolbar. This is better. Better. It's called the Nutshell Toolbar, and uh, our PC just shut down, so we're going to have to wait. wait a bit. There it goes. So is this another toolbar that we yes. use instead yes. of the Google you get toolbar. rid of the Google, you don't, because you don't want another toolbar, because you already have, you know, limited Sure, space. I browse at 640 by 480. Well, Screen real estate is precious. Well, all right. So here we are, if we want to take a look at this. Um, we are at the Screensavers website, and if we wanted to search for Patrick, we could use the Screensaver search engine. But it's we an, wouldn't uh, find No, much. it's an open source <laughs> solution that's not so great. Um, or we could try using Google and, you know, site, colon, whatever our search term is. Or we can hear, I've already downloaded, so I'm going to right click, and I'm going to choose Nutshell, and that's the Nutshell toolbar. And then you can make it bigger, smaller, you can move it around wherever you want. Maybe I want it up here. I mean, you really don't need that all that space. You can move. So now I'm going to click search for Patrick Norton. And then see this little go button? See this little go button with the little red right here? Ah, I see it. Yes, yeah, so you uh, click on that. And then I'm going to, I could search the web or I could search just tech TV. I could search Amazon. I could search dictionary.com. I could search Internet Movie Database or Daypop, which is a news search. To, uh, aggregates weblogs and such. I'm going to search Internet Movie Database for Patrick. <laughs> You're going to find very little, if not oh, nothing. Oh, no, there you are. That's so frightening. Your oh, your birthday. I don't know if you wanted to show that on the air. <laughs> and uh, all of your, your filmography. This is very cool. I mean, even Kevin, who he's like, uh, usually I don't really like your downloads, but this one's really cool. So <laughs> I like it. What do they get in a nutshell? Oh, at the screensavers.com. And uh, yeah, we have a URL to their website. And it's created by a man named Andre, who's very excited because no one's ever reviewed his product before. Congratulations, <laughs> Andre. Now, tune in tomorrow when Megan shows you how to download a tool for professional astronomers for free. Mm -hmm. Now, up next, Burt Monroy is here, back from schmoozing with Adobe, and he's got a surprise. A little Adobe 7.0 when the screensavers continues. So excited about this. Welcome back to the Screensavers. I'm Leo Laporte. Coming up in this very half hour, we're going to show you how you can turn a computer into a standalone MP3 player for zero bucks, 20 bucks, 400 bucks, and anywhere in between. Plus, we're going to show you how to get a thousand, what is it, a $3,000 program for free. 7500 7, How much would you pay now? It's free. <laughs> Every time our next guest shows up, we learn a wonderful new Photoshop tip. Today, a surprise. Digital artist and uh, author extraordinaire Bert Monroy is back. Hey, Bert. How you doing? Normally, we have to boot up into uh, OS 9 for you to do your Macintosh uh, photo shopping. OS 10. OS, OS 10, 10, ladies and gentlemen, Photoshop 7. Now, they announced that at Seabold this week. No, not at Seabold. They oh, did it at the PMA down in Florida. Okay. The Photo Marketing Association show. And you were down there for and that. And I was down there. Uh, but it's not going to be available in stores till when? Till April. April. That's April. Oh, yeah. We gotta wait a while. It's a, a short while. How can we get a copy here, though? Well, you know, you because, have friends. Well, I'm I'm one of the magnificent seven, as they call it. We knew uh, that. There's seven artists that they're using to profile the program and oh, so on. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So you've been beta testing it. Uh, I was an alpha tester way oh, wow. back uh, last summer. Pretty pretty stable. Very stable. It's been stable for months. 
but uh, it's got some really cool features. Now, right, uh, first thing, and I think a lot of Photoshop users will be pleased, even though we're running in 10, the user interface is almost identical. It's been aquified, but there's no other real difference. Uh, well, right? except for the little uh, changing of the little colors on the little tools. Well, that's they, nice. That's cute. You know. But your hand will still go to the same place to get the marquee, same to get place, the brush, yeah. to get the... Okay. There's a few little changes, a few new palettes in here, which we're going to look at. All right. The first uh, tool I'm going to show you is one that's good for photographers who can't take good shots, or they got mess shots like this. Well, this is an old picture. We this is an old up. shot, right. Now, most people will go to the clone tool to go in there and start cleaning all this stuff up. Clone tool will just pick up a color from one location and, and then you can draw with that exactly. color in another. But in this case, as you see, there's so many different parts all it's over this picture. Work, yeah. There's a lot of cloning. So yeah. we have now what's called the healing brush. That's the band-aid. A little band-aid there, the <laughs> healing brush. Now, kind of like the clone tool, I'm going to go in there and sample an area right there. I'm going to just click right there. So you, you press option the option button. key to exactly. pick up a color. Now, it's not picking up a color. What it's picking up is a whole series of things, like the texture and a lot of things. Oh, so watch. When I paint right across here, oh, see, it just picks perfect. that up like that. But watch what happens when I go over here to his hair. Whoop. It knew. See? It goes into this dark area here. I go over here to his lapel. I clean right across there. And you see that it, it starts to average out the area. So when I clean oh, little look areas, at that. Yeah. Here, let's get this big smudge right here. Clean that up. and so, But it took the black from up here, but it, it got the color and, and it, it averages it. Yes, it goes in there and looks at all the different textures, and it cleans them up and averages it out. So it's can you, can you get this dandruff on his shoulder? Because it's driving me crazy. Yeah, let's go in there and get this that's, little... That's so it's interesting there. that it's dark, but then it cleans it up. Right. It's oh. just sampling that area, and then that. it goes in there and redoes it. Yep. That is going to be a boon. That's cool. But Wonderful. now, here's, here's the cool part. Yeah. All right, this is what I really like. It's a tree. Yes, sir. The tree has no leaves on it. No. Nope. Painting leaves has always been a real chore because there's a lot of leaves. Right. So we have a new feature. You'll need a leaf hose. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to just turn on just this one layer here. Yeah. And I got a path. And basically what I'm going to do is create a custom brush. Now I'm going to take that and I got black. So I'm going to go in there and fill that. Let me just drag that over there. Oops. I'm getting in the wrong place here. Let's just go in there and well, fill that up with that. black. There we go. Okay. All right. I'm going to select that just like you would to create a custom brush. So I'm going to turn off my background here just to make sure that I have a, a clean brush. And I go to this usual place, which is right here that says Define Brush. Let's go down and Define Brush. Let's me name it just like before. That hasn't changed at all, right? Now, here comes the cool part. I'm going to dump that. We don't need it anymore. And let's go back to see all our stuff here. And right above this, I'm going to create a layer. And this is where I'm going to start using my brush. I get my paintbrush. And I choose that brush that we just created. There it is, right? Now, we have a new tool down here, a whole new palette, which is your brushes palette. Now, watch. When I bring this in here, I've got all these uh, things that I can do. Down here, I see a little preview of what the brush is going to do when I just stroke it across the page. So let's go in there and play with the shape dynamics. So now we see that the size is changing according to my little pen pressure there. Let's do a size jitter so that the size is going to change over time as I start to travel. So it's going through a lot of different changes. And the minimum di diameter, I'm going to bring that up so I don't get such a tiny little leaf, right? right. That's, that's going to be good. The angle, I'm going to play around with the angle of this thing so that it changes uh, as you can see that some of the leaves are up and some right. are down and so on. And the roundness. The roundness is going to control. Right now, the leaf is a nice flat shape like that. So I can change the roundness so it starts to look like we're looking at it at an angle. And we want it, otherwise it'll all be facing us. We exactly. want it to move so around. as I start to push this up, you see that the leaves change. Now, here's where you're really going to see the difference. Yeah, because they're so close together here. We... Right. And scatter, I'm going to scatter on both axes. And I'm going to bring this up so you see that the oh, leaves are starting to separating. There Maybe you go. Pan down a little bit. You see that? Look at that. They're separating out there. It's uh, uh, separating. This is the count. As I'm stroking, it's going to increase the amount of leaves that are being produced. Now you've got a pile of leaves. And a count jitter, which means I'm going to, uh, over time there, it's going to change that, that amount. i got textures, dual brushes, all kinds of stuff, but color dynamics. I'm going to play with color for now. I'm going to have it go between the foreground and the background color, 100%. So it's just going to change between those two colors. And change the hue just a little. You change it too much, and it's going to introduce reds and all yeah. kinds of purples and stuff. And the, the saturation, I'm going to push that up a little bit. All right, so that's all I need for now. All right, so I get this guy out of the way, and let's go pick some colors. So I get my swatches, and I'll pick this nice, uh, let's say that we pick this green right it's here. It's spring. We have nice, pretty green leaves. And then I'm going to pick this darker green for the background. Okay. And the size is a little big right now, so what I'm going to do is just go in here and reduce it just a little bit, and as I start to paint... <gasps> Look at that. Look at that. 
I'm painting whole oh, masses goodness. of trees. And the leaves. colors alternating because you're because you have some jitter between the foreground and background. Exactly. Colors. Now I can go in here and let's just make this a really dark uh, color, and uh, in a layer behind it. I could just go in here and throw some other leaves back oh, here. That's just that. the ones in the background. Look at right? that. That is so great. Start adding all these little features. So, so you've you, always been able to find custom brushes, but this is a smart custom right, brush. Right, because now you can make all kinds of brushes that uh, for clouds and grass and oh, all kinds of things. That Anything is Anything you want it to be. New brushes. We've got the healing tool. How many new features do you know? I mean, is there? Oh, there's many, many new features. There's a new file browser that allows you to go in there and. Uh, um, Let's just choose what, you, what you're what you working on. That's nice. Yeah, we've got the brushes. We all, you know, we even have a, a spelling checker now. <laughs> There's a spelling checker. Now, that's I great. i got to remember where it is. Now, that's built into checker. OS X, so they're yeah. probably just using the system so wide. So that's great. Can, uh, check different languages is and all there a kinds of tools. Is there painting, a painting module, too? Well, this paint... Uh, um, this is it here. This brush that I have down here. That's the paint This is the new paint uh, engine okay. that allows you to create all kinds that's of special That's what you were effects. working on, right? This is what I was working on to... To create all kinds of, in fact, some of the brushes, like this maple leaf brush, is in there. There's grass, there's smoke, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do. Justly proud of your work. It's a fun product. And you like it, Photoshop 7. It's going to be out in April. You saw it here first before anybody did. Finally, I get rid of OS 9. Yeah. I'm so excited. <laughs> this is this is going to sell more Macs probably than anything ever. That's yeah. wonderful. Uh, Bert's book, which is a great book about uh, if you're a Photoshop user, it's almost a, a requirement. A photorealistic techniques in Photoshop. Bert Monroy is the king, one of the magnificent seven. We're so glad we could have you on the screen savers. Please it's come back and show us some more stuff. It's always a pleasure I, to be here. I love it. It's so much fun. www.bertmonroy.com and we've compiled all the tips because Bert's been here many, many times into a, web, a single page on the screensavers.com so you can go back. Look, if you've never used Photoshop, if you're a Photoshop expert, there's something for you all at the screensavers.com. Coming up next, we're going to show you how to build a sleek and powerful MP3 player that connects directly to your home stereo system for the price of no dollars. When the screensavers continue. to enter the Super Geek Challenge. I want you to answer 10 easy questions. I want you to fill out the form and I want you to enter to win free stuff. So go to thescreensavers.com and scroll to the bottom of the page. Scroll like you mean it. Scroll as you've never scrolled before. Then click on the link that says Super Geek Challenge Bionic Gamer Gear. Then accept the challenge and go my friend. Make me proud. Sorry for pointing before. Remember, you gotta be in it to win it. Pat and Leo. We're practicing Sorry. our party routine. <laughs> all right, instead of stringing miles of audio cable around the house or buying an MP3 appliance, you know what, Leo? We could have all these boxes on our table. No normal human being would have all these boxes on their table. I hope not. We can only My wife not. would kill me. I don't even have a wife, but <laughs> someone's wife would come killed. over and slap me silly. All right, there's a reason we got all this stuff up here. We've had a lot of stuff, a lot of pre-made MP3 players. We have the Rio receiver, the Slim P3, which is really cool, network-based. You, you plug it in your Ethernet network, you play files from some other server on your house. We showed Snow Crash, which can remote control Winamp. You know what? You don't need to do any of this. These are standalone MP3 players for your home, like mm -hmm. components that would go in your stereo system is the idea. Exactly. It, 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 to be honest with you, you're going to need to get a can of black spray paint or you're going to need to do something like... <laughs> Unless you have beige stereo equipment. Unless you have beige stereo equipment. Yeah. Where we, we've got a PC case all the way over here that's actually a black PC case right. you can build it into. We're going to start low rent, though. Okay, cheap. Uh, you said zero dollars. Zero dollars is either begging, borrowing, we don't normally steal on the screen savers. This was pretty old. This is this a 46, is old, right? This is 46. It'll barely play it. So 46, 66. That's the minimum? With a whopping 16 megabytes of RAM. I would say the minimum is a 46 DX100 okay. or at least a Pentium 100. This was an old uh, computer that we <laughs> IT, our IT department had. These were yeah. used as uh, servers or something. And before that, they were used by ZD Labs to do network testing. And, and these are the things that are lining up in that landfill. So there are plenty exactly. of these out there. There are plenty of these out there. There's cheap. I actually picked up for a whopping total of $11 two, like a, a Pentium based, a dual Pentium based system wow. from I don't know where and another 40. eBay would have them, lots eBay of places would have them. Garage them. sales will have them. So what do we, how can we turn this into an MP3 player? You can barely, if you have to run in Windows, you can just barely run Sonic. 
Sonic, which is a, a, uh, a Windows-based MP3 player. Why Sonic instead of Winamp? I tried Winamp. I couldn't get Winamp to run, no matter how I changed the settings okay. on a on a system with that little power. And this it's is Windows 95. It's Windows 95 running here. Again, a whopping 16 megabytes of RAM. Obviously, you need a sound card for the output. You're going to need a sound card. I Does got a matter what sound kind? blaster. And I would get a sound blaster simply because if you're going to do this in DOS, and if you have a system that slow, you're going to be probably be running a program called DAMP, which is a DOS uh, MP3 player, or MX Play, which is another DOS MP3 player. You're going to have to create a DOS boot disk, and you're going to have to remember remember this. Yeah, yeah. yeah I forgot how much I hate. The setting up environment variables exactly. for the uh, sound Auto exec that yeah. bat file, yeah, and it's yeah. just criminally irritating to yeah. set all this up. But you can do it. But you can do it. But you know what? I'd wait. Instead of getting the 486 machine, I'd wait until I found a cheap penny at machine. Because then you can run Windows no hassle. Well, click over a couple, and it actually starts to look kind of interesting. Where is my, uh, which mouse is That's uh, Belkin. Belkin over to, uh, which one are we going to run? Who's Belkin you One's have? going to sleep. There we go. Oh, it's playing. It stopped. Now, how do I get it started? Just, okay. We'll show that in there. We actually have a, this is a basically, I believe it's a 400 megahertz K6 system. Okay. You can pick up this chip for about $3, assuming anybody's actually still selling them. It'll work on like a 200 megahertz Pentium. And what it's doing here is auto launch. You get the usual Winamp display. Set this hey, that's pretty run. good frame rate, though. That does not look bad. That is no. That is a Pentium one. What? How fast a Pentium? This is a K6400. K6400. Yes, right. You said K6400. P200 will work like this. P133 will, will work pretty much. The visualization gets tough the slower the system you go. But a P200 or better should be able to give you all the nice visualization. So you set it up in a corner. I like it. You load it up. You load up all put your songs on, on it. You put a playlist. Let it go. And just sit in your lazy boy and never move again. Well, you know. Let, let me ask you though. The one thing that I like about these old low mm -hmm. slow computers is the fan. It's going to be quieter. Mm -hmm. I hear a lot of noise coming out of this because it's got a big old fan on well, it. Well, the, the thing, it's got a fan on the back, but you can actually put an older, actually the one you hear is that one. Oh, that See was, quieter so the old got? one was noisy. The old one was noisy. A lot of the Pentium actually, they had passive fans. They don't even have a, a, That's a what fan you're for. on the processor. Because you don't want to have a lot of noise coming out of your stereo. Yeah, you can rack. spend five, six bucks to get a big, what they call biscuit fan that's spinning at low RPMs. That'll pull the air out of the back. Okay. And the truth is you don't even need much of that. So you're not working this thing that hard. You're no. just playing back music. All right. No, it's good stuff. This, I think, we can put together for about $20, $25. If you scrounge, you know, hit the garage sales, hit the flea markets. Hey, many people have in their attic or basement, something like I that. I bet a lot of people have in their this attic This actually was, a, we should mention, a reference system that AMD sent us when the K6 400 came out. A long time ago. A long ago. time ago. This was a very expensive system, and now it's worth about... 40 bucks. Well, I've got a Cyrex 266. It's worth even less than that. I've got some old 90 megahertz penny. You can recycle it and do something great. Yeah, with it. and you know what? The other thing is, like, the thing we didn't do here is the finishing touches. Basically, spray the thing black, turn right. it on its side. Okay. You know? You just still want to have the CD player and stuff like that so you can rip more music on I it? I would not rip music on anything slower than a gigahertz machine. Okay. You know so why? rip it on your main because system. Because it takes for Rip it on your main system, transfer it over to this system. Okay. Don't worry would about it. Do you want a zip drive on here things. or? How are you I gonna just, get the, I'd, I'd rather do it by Ethernet. So connect up a network mm -hmm. cable. So you'd want a network card. Ideally, you have a network right. card. Right. If you want to do it really fast, you just drag the hard drive out of this one, take it to the other system, transfer it. Then it'll sure. be really fast. That's really fast. Again, this is homebrew. All right, finally, we got the... This is the high end. Yeah, the, 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 Yoshi, the Yoshi and Joshua special. I like it. They found this beautiful little silver case. It's beautiful. Actually, right. we have a whole stack of nice cases over here. This is if you're going to start spending money. Okay. We're back when you get a DVD drive, you get a fast processor. They got a shuttle-based uh, system for 250 yeah. bucks. 250 bucks included the case. And actually, what's interesting about this, I'm going to turn this around and hopefully not horrible things are going to happen. Would you like to hold a wireless keyboard, I'd Leo? be glad to. Thank you. So when I turn this around, take a look at the back of this. This thing was basically already configured. It's got audio on the motherboard. Not my favorite quality of audio on the motherboard, but it's in there. As long as it's 16-bit audio, I yeah. think you'd probably be all right. Oops. Oh. Sorry yes. about that. He's putting the fan right on. But you'll basically see the Ethernet's built in, the audio's built in, and the television nice. out's built in. And the bare bone system minus a hard drive was 250. You'd want to add a mm -hmm. hard drive. You're going to need a hard drive. these days. Yeah, you get a cheap A little one. more RAM. How much RAM is the minimum to do this? I'll be honest with you, I think we're running on 64 megabytes in this system. In the K6? 32 is a good starting point. As long as Windows can run, in other words, you're okay. Again, the 486 was 16 megabytes of RAM. Now, I noticed this thing. What does this do? This is a <laughs> the gyration. This came out a long time ago. It's a gyro-based. So basically, whoops, Let's see if we can manage to. It's a mouse. It's a, a mouse, mouse in a remote control size shape. Exactly. And we're controlling the TV over here with it. So we're turning it over, and we've got our Winamp set up. Oh, but, see, also, but that's nice, because then you could switch to video three on your big screen display. Right. Turn on Winamp. Launch the music, get the visualizations on there, or go back a, to Wide World of Sports. You're going to be happy. We've got a DVD player built in this. We've got DVD. We've got That's web browsing. Really? We've got Winamp all, on this. All together, how much do you think? Oh, uh, boy. $250 for the basic, $200 for the uh, really slick wireless expensive. mouse and keyboard. And a hard drive going to be another $150. Right. Bucks. So 
But I do like the wireless keyboard because you can. This is yeah. like web TV too. But you can get a wireless keyboard. Like you know, I got a wireless mouse from CompUSA for under twenty dollars. Right. Like Nineteen dollars. Seventy bucks if you get the uh, wonderful Logitech mm -hmm. wireless mouse and keyboard. So you don't have to spend a whole lot of money. Yeah. But if you want the really slick. You know, gyroscope based. Now, I am hoping and I am counting on the fact that on the website you have put a list, a sh like a shopping list for mm -hmm. all this stuff, because this all went very quickly. Put down a basic, basic, basic guidelines. You know, what you need. I'd love it if somebody, it would be great if a Linux Maven came out, did like a, a floppy disk installation of Linux that would detect all the basic. That's not going to be that hard. I, I don't have the Linux chops to do it, but I'm calling to you out there, somebody with the mad Linux chops, put together a bootable I Linux. I like that disk. better because I don't have to restart the machine. I can, it'll run for years. Well, the thing is, yeah, or you, you know, you boot it in DOS or leave it in Windows. Chances are, if you don't change anything, I it'll stay running for about forever. And if you use Winamp, get a program called Resume. It saves all your settings in case it does crash or you set it down. It'll like automatically that. restart wherever you were. All the details where? Screensavers.com. Got to love that. Coming up next, it's $7,500 if you'd buy it in the store. Today it can be yours for the low, low price of absolutely nothing. Find out more how you can get Maya for free. You can set your browser's homepage to an HTML page on your own computer. Fill it in with your favorite links for quick access to the websites that you like the best. We don't plan it this way, but every once in a while, a show will have kind of a theme. We had an artificial intelligence day earlier this week. Today is graphics program day, and uh, we did 2D graphics with Photoshop 7. Now we're going to talk about 3D graphics, and what I think many people agree is the best 3D animation software out there, certainly used by m in many of the latest Hollywood films. It's called Maya 3D. Shrek used it. Monsters Incorporated used it. It, it was used in Lord of the Rings. Remember that scene where they're going down the river and they have the giant statues there that's Maya but if you want to do that kind of thing yourself you don't have to spend 7500 bucks anymore there's a new learning edition available for free download he announced it here on the show a couple of months ago we said come back when it's available online we'd like to talk more about it director of Maya technology Andrew Pierce welcome back thank you Leo congratulations well thanks very much how long has this been online this has been online since Monday and the website is just swamped. How, I think many, how, how many downloads? You? Uh, a couple days ago we had over 9,000 and that was, you know, we would have had more if we had more bandwidth. Well, there's we huge just, interest in this. Now, how is it anytime somebody puts a big expensive program online for free, there's a catch. What, what can I not do with this? You cannot trade uh, files with the commercial version okay. and there is a watermark in the screen and in the rendering. So they have this the little bug that says Maya yeah, in and everything. This, and this is not for commercial use okay. here as well. But if I'm a student or I want to learn how to use 3D rendering programs, I can do everything. You can there's, do everything. You can save, save files, files. You can oh, retrieve files. It's a it's a different format than the commercial version. Just so that you, yeah. just so you don't can't trade them. But other than that, it's all free. Um, there's I, I love on the this. website. There's tons of tutorials. I love this because I, you're smart because you're going to get people hooked on Maya. We and a so. lot of times, you know, they get a 30-day demo. It's not enough. And if I'm a student, I can't afford this, but I really want to learn it. This is this is really nice. So we congratulations. Used have, we used to have that too, and we heard the same thing. Yeah. Not, not enough time to learn it. It's deep. Now, um, what I thought we could do, Andrew, today, since people are going to be downloading it. We're going to be breaking your servers right now. Mm -hmm. uh, is show them just get get us, get us started so that I can just kind of get going with Maya. Okay, so I've, we've launched the program. This is what you see. This is what you see. You see a perspective view here. The grid is turned off right now. Let me just wait. Turn wait, 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 wait. What's that? You this? just press the space bar to I get that. Press, press and held the space bar. It's the the hot box. So this tells you kind of everything you can do. Everything you can do. Actually, this is just the modeling commands. There's many more commands. But that's nice because okay, those are hidden. So you can All get right. the, you can get that out of the way. And uh, on the Mac, we have a little special thing to hide the dock. We want to see the, oh, that's nice. So now we get a full screen. Done. Full screen view. Menu goes away, too. And if, you know, a lot of artists want everything out of the way. They want to yeah, just yeah, be able to I use, want to see my stuff. They'll see your stuff. So you get the menus out of the way. And when you need the menus, hold down the space bar. You've got access to every function of mine. Got it. So that's now, pretty cool. you said this is the perspective view. Uh, this is the perspective view up here. What is the perspective view? Perspective view is just a, a 3D view on your scene. Okay. You know, you're, you're probably used to... You have other views, Photoshop. too. Yeah. That's the 2D view? This is the front view. This is the side view. This is the top got view. It. Very architectural. Most artists that's work things. in which view? Or all four? Um, all four. You'll, you'll use different views for different things. Okay. Um, Maya's got a lot of tools that let you work directly in the perspective all the time with manipulators and whatnot. Right. But so let's, let's, okay, so let's, so let's, let's let me show you some stuff here. Let's do some stuff. Okay, I'm going to go to the front view actually to start with, and I'm just okay. going to show you how easy it is to create a 3D object to start with. And this is going to be beautiful because I'm not going to take a lot of time. This is a little Bezier curve this drawing is, tool. Kind of if you use uh, Illustrator, you'd be familiar with yeah, this. It's, yeah, it's actually a NURBS curve. NURBS. But Similar. It's, yeah, a little bit more math. But okay. basically the same kind well, of control. Well, Bezier is really good for only for 2D. You need NURBS to do a 3D. Is that the reason? Uh, well, it gives you a, a few more Points. controls, right? Okay. So you can, you know, if you're used to... Uh, neat. 
All right. No. You so we're, draw, we're drawing a line, basically, a curve. We're drawing a curve, you know, in 2D, and everyone's cool with that. And uh, then we want to create a surface. So we go up here and we say revolve. And just like that, we we've got suddenly a got stick. a candlestick or a pawn or some sort of object. I don't know what it can is. Can you make the, you know, it's a, the light green is a little hard. There we go. How's there that? There we go. Now I better? can see it. There you go. So, oh, look at that. So we've got a 3D object here. And I just want to show you just how easy it is to start you know, creating an animation. Probably good to first, start with a simple one, like a ball or a candlestick like this. because Something very, very... Very simple. Right. Let me just uh, start here and delete uh, history on this so that I can. There's no history. We know nothing. That. We know nothing. And I'm going to create a ground plane here. Uh, now, what's the ground plane? That's the bot. That's the floor. This is the floor. And I'm using one of the manipulators that allows us to do stretch, it. stretch. stretch. to work stuff in 3D. It's okay. a scale. We also have rotate and translate, and those are all available by hotkeys. And there's a, there's a few other controls you can okay. have too. Those are the ones I'll use just now. So you can see we've got this object over this plane. So and you're just it. rotating that by clicking on it and just moving the mouse around. Just clicking on the mouse and dragging it around. Okay. Like that. And uh, this is... Oops, I didn't mean to do that. There we go. Uh, this is one of the things we can do is we'll pick this object and we'll go over to our dynamics menu. We will create a field on this. What's a field? A field is, you know, a force. Okay. In this case, I added gravity to this object. And I'm going to pick this object and I'm going to make it a passive rigid body. A passive rigid body passive rigid in body. gravity, and, like me. And this thing... <laughs> and I like bet it's going to fall. Look at that! There you go! Oh, that's so neat! I just made an animation. So it understands physics. It understands physics. There it goes. Oh! oh. And it's... <laughs> Goodbye, Pawn! Now, this is the same Dynamics engine they used to do lots of uh, special effects in movies. Uh, Star Wars Episode One. They uh, the pod the race fields? when they destroyed Just out of curiosity, what other force fields uh, are there? Well, we've got some other ones in there. Uh, Let's see, air, air drag, drag, gravity, gravity yeah. Newton, oh, radio, so turbulence, uniform, that's vortex, so fun. volume access. So what I want to do now is show you a different scene. Okay. And I've just made a little button up here. That's, that's very simple to do in Maya. You can open your script editor and everything you do is... It's keeping track of it. It's keeping track of it. So if you want to create a shortcut to do something, you can just select it. Drag select it your our curve. And there you go. And you click that button and it's going to pop and up. Whatever if I you click do. that, it'll select our curve. But there is no our curve and it'll tell me that because right. I just deleted the scene that had our curve in it. Okay. So I've just loaded in this new scene, and um, the only difference is I don't have any dynamics on it. So if I play back right now, nothing, nothing happens. happens. We need a we need a little. We put some gravity on that bowling ball. Just what can we do just here? Just like that. So that's what I've done here. I made the little button. I basically did this before the show and made a little button up there, just like I showed you. Mm -hmm. To do this, and down goes the bowling ball, Bang. and it's coming, and uh, it's boing. a rubber bowling ball. Yeah. That's well, so that's good. okay. Well, you and know. here it comes. Are we going to get a strike? Uh, no, it's got about the mass of a. Beach ball, it looks like. So let's. But you wait, 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 wait. Now, did you have to tell each pin what to do in case of a strike? No, I just said they're active rigid bodies that and got hit by that got, get hit by this other. And it understands body. Newtonian physics and, and it reacts appropriately. It does, and you've got That's all sorts of parameters cool. here. So I picked the bowling ball and let's increase its mass. Shall yeah, we? let's get that up there. Uh, let's make, make it a little heavier. Twenty-two. And it's awfully bouncy. That's Can we? Way too much. <laughs> it's going to go right through the floor. <laughs> Would it go through the floor if you made it too heavy? Uh, no, it'll still. Okay, we got an infinitely strong floor. Reduce the bouncing right. there a bit. Now let's play it back. And now let's play it back. And it goes a little bit faster. Actually, it doesn't go any faster because we know from physics that it doesn't matter how. That's how much right. Weight. But it's going to do. It's going to do some damage this time hope so. if it ever Come gets on. to the pin. Come on, move Can it. you increase the strength of the bowler? Yes, we can. Oh, and look at there we go. There we go. But it's not stopping. It's going to go right through. Hey, that's wonderful. Yeah, but okay, but that's. But we get the okay. idea. So, so you have the physics built in. We have the physics built in. I've made the simple UI basically by. Um, you designed this, this? I designed this. Oh, I just I said, make a slider here, call it mass, so I can play with the mass, I can uh, oh, reduce so cool. the bounciness on it, I can give it some downward force, increase the strength of the bowler, basically. Andrew, you've shown us enough now that okay. we can download this, we can play with it, we can, uh, we can get started. Oh, now we're going to really get some now real bowling going. going. There. I hope I Where can they get the download, ladies? They can get the download from aliaswavefront.com. We've got a link off the main page there. Right. Oh, no straight. Aliaswavefront.com, ladies and gentlemen. Maya... You saw, you saw, this is the only, it's got this watermark got in here and the bug down there, and you can't trade files with a professional, but everything else you can do. And what a great, there's a Leo pin. There's Leo pins. I've added that. No, to the no, 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 no that Andrew made just for, <laughs> just for you to play with. Can you increase my mass? Absolutely. Can you decrease my mass? Well, let's, let's uh, be on my physical so. capability. Stay where you are, folks. Still to come on this very show, Martin shows us a few movie reviews from a dermatologist. Yes, a dermatologist. Plus, 
alternative desktop choices for your Linux box, and we're still celebrating Black History Month, last day of the month. We've got a few online resources to wrap things up, and that and a whole lot more coming up as the screensavers rolls on. the screensavers. Watch the lights, kids. I'm Hello. Leo Laporte. And I'm Patrick Norton. And the whole house is coming down. Fatty Matty on the jib today. Woo! He's Woo. out of control. <laughs> coming up in this half hour, discover alternative operating systems for your Linux box. I don't think so. Windows How about managers. alternative Windows managers yes, for say Linux that. box? No worries. Folks, Martin's going to, well, he's still celebrating the last day of Black History Month. He's got a few online resources. And he's got his own apricot scrub, and I'm not sure what that's all about, but we'll find out. I don't know if I want to know what that's all about. Meanwhile, let's check in with the folks over at Tech Live, see what's coming up on Tech Live tonight. Erica Hill's on the Tech Live set. Hey, Erica. Good evening, gentlemen. Plenty evening. coming up tonight. Good evening. Good evening. Tonight, we're actually going to examine the latest developments in human cloning. British lawmakers are opening the door for cloning research on human embryos. We're going to tell you more about that coming up on the show a little bit later. Also, we're going to check out a new trend in video games that sort of takes the fun out of gaming, actually. White supremacist groups are adapting popular video games oh. to broadcast their messages of hate, and perhaps most troubling of all, they are targeting young people with these games. Well, have a full report for you coming up on Tech Live tonight. Plus, we're going to look at what one company is doing to protect its sports memorabilia from counterfeiters. A new device called the Pen Cam combines a pen with a video camera. It documents the actual signing of autographed items and it digitally records them so then you can go back and check and make sure that it is authentic as you think it is. Wow. Not too shabby, huh? Isn't that cool? Very cool, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing more on that, too. So we're going to tell you all about that and much, much more. That is, of course, tonight on Tech Live at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific. Thank you so much, Erica Hill. Thank you. That'll be tonight on Tech Live. So did you watch the, uh, did you, the Grammy Awards went till midnight. Yeah. Yeah. Midnight. What, you went to sleep, Ken? You didn't stay up for the whole thing? It's like 11, well, I don't know. I went to bed at 11.46. I don't know how much later it went. Okay, it's not midnight. Well, that's almost producer. midnight. That's why he's sitting in the big chair. <laughs> Close. Close. Nice boys. Did you watch? Did you watch? No, I watched. Off and on, when I wasn't mm -hmm. half fast asleep. And uh, what was the what was the, the big weird thing? And then we were all talking about it. And I think in office coolers all over the uh, country, people are talking about this. The weird thing, not what Brittany was wearing, uh, although that was weird. But or did you see what Cheryl Crow was wearing? It looked like a doily. She was wearing a doily. I think was all. But that's not what we're talking about. Well, we're talking about that a little bit. Mostly we're talking about the music piracy speech that C. Michael Green, the head of the National, of NARIS, the National mm -hmm. Recording uh, Arts and Sci Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences uh, gave. Just a diatribe, in case you were watching us instead of the Grammys last night, let, let's give you a little bit of, uh, of his speech from the Grammys last night. It's much, much worse. No question the most insidious virus in the midst of this illegal downloading of music is piracy on the net. It goes by many names, and its apologists offer a myriad of excuses. This illegal file sharing and ripping of music is pervasive, out of control, and it's oh so criminal. He went on and on and on. It was a long speech against music piracy. In fact, they had some kids. The whole show, they have kids in, in uh -huh. the background downloading music. They said, now, little Jimmy, how many songs did you download during our show tonight? And I mean, it was just, they clearly, it's a big head up, big problem. You've heard the music industry. You've heard Hillary Rosen of the Recording Industry Association of America speak many times in the last few months. The, the recording industry is taking it to the people, saying, please yeah. stop stealing music. Our question for you today, have you changed your position on music piracy, yes or no? Go to thescreensavers.com and vote. On the other side, with all the music copy protection they're doing on CDs, maybe, you, maybe you've changed your position mm -hmm. for the other side. I don't know. It's all a little complicated. We're going to have some fun uh, next month. You know what we're doing? What are we doing? We're giving away ah. a brand new Gateway 500 SE system. Would you like to win one? You're going to have a chance to win one between March 4th and 15th. Ten lucky winners will each receive one of these systems, Gateway 500 SE PCs with 1.6 gigahertz model uh, Intel Pentium 4 processors. The 15-inch uh, flat screen display, the CD burner, the 128 megs of RAM is a nice system. Mm -hmm. Go to thescreensavers.com. All the details are there. You've got to sign up now so you can win in March. And good luck to you. So we check in with Marty for the site of the night? I would like to do that. Let's do that. What is he doing? I don't don't hate know. me because I'm beautiful. 
<laughs> I take meticulous care of my skin, only using product of the highest quality that usually contains extracts of exotic tropical fruits. I'm exfoliating right now. That's why I was excited to find the site Skinema.com, the site that reviews the skin conditions of movie characters. Let's take a look at the review of the fabulous Lord of the Rings. Now remember the evil wizard Samorin? He sports lesions and sunspots all over his forehead, remember? Now this is exceedingly common. These blemishes develop after sunburns. Though not individually at risk for becoming cancerous, they are a sign of sun-damaged skin, Samorin. Lasers can fade them, though prevention is the best medicine. He should take care to always wear SPF 45 or higher. Now compare his skin to Frodo's. It positively glows. Clearly Frodo always applies a deep cleansing exfoliate before going to bed at night. But wait, wait, look, look, Sommerin's nails, his nails, they're the kind of healthy nails that most women would die for. Nails are a reflection of the overall health and hydration of the skin. Way to be, Sommerin! Uh-oh, in contrast, look at Frodo's nails. Clearly Frodo's a nail biter. Known as anacophagia, nail biting is very common among humans and apparently also among hobbits. While chronic nail biting does result in faster growing nails, it increases the likelihood of bacterial nail infection. And Frodo, 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 we need to do something about those feet, honey. He should look into waxing, electrolysis, or laser hair removal. Frodo would be a good candidate for the latter since he has fair skin and dark foot hair. The laser energy specifically targets dark color, passing through the skin like light through Frodo's window in the quaint town of Hobbiton. Now be sure to keep sending me your sight of the night suggestions. The address is martin at techtv.com. Now coming up after the break, I'm going to celebrate Black History Month with a few must-have bookmarks when the screensaver continues. day of Black History Month. So let's finish February off right with three sites for hardcore black geeks. There are actually five, but the other two will be on the web. The other two are on the web. We're running a little short on time. So let's just go to number three. Black Geeks Online. It's a community of 30,000 members. They call it a community linking technical professionals, educators, entrepreneurs, students, parents, and community leaders with technology news, information, and resources. If, if you want That's to network cool. Look at that. with other IT professionals, other uh, computer science professors, this sort of thing, this is the place to go. 30,000 members strong. And that's where all you're going to get all your news and everything you need. Mm -hmm. Let's go to number two. Black mm -hmm. Futurist strives to be a uh, central location on the internet for deep intellectual discussion, planning, collaboration, and visionary thinking among black people concerned about scientific, technological, and economic development in the 21st century and beyond. This is a really cool site. Black issues going forward into the 21st century and beyond. All the stuff that you think about when you normally think about the futurist movements. Looking forward in time. I love it. And number one, the purpose of SciFiNoir.com is to provide a forum to promote awareness of Afrocentric perspectives within the genres of science fiction and fantasies. And if you're a writer, this is the place that you want to be posting your science fiction or fantasy work. Or if you're an artist or a poet or a critic, you can read the work of other yeah, they writers. got whole books on That's here. That's really, really cool. SciFiNoir.com. And that, unfortunately, is all we're going to have time Ooh, for. But there's actually three more wonderful sites in my article at thescreensavers.com. More pictures of Frodo's feet, too, right? Uh, you know it, baby. Okay, baby. If you're tired of the old command prompt or if KDE is getting on your N-E-R-V-E-S, we're going to show you some elite alternatives, some Windows managers you may not have seen before for your Linux box with the screensavers continue. It's time for our alternative segment. Any tip or trip about an alternative and everything is made not Microsoft Windows. And today we're doing a little bit of Linux stuff. This is actually Linux GUI stuff. Linux GUI day? And in order to understand this, you have to understand the distinction between the X Window Manager and your Windows Managers. It's the same thing in Windows where you have Windows, you have the kernel, right. but you also have your shell, which is the direct user interface. In Linux, you've got a, a window manager, which mm -hmm. or, or an X window system rather, which is a server that does all the GUI stuff. But it can look a variety of different ways. Think of it as a skinnable a GUI. So by putting a Windows manager on, on top, top of, of X window system, 
You can change the, completely the look and feel and operation of your system. I bet you're going to give us some examples. I'm going to show you a couple of examples. If you, uh, if you have Linux automatically going to X Windows, as most people do, mm -hmm. uh, this is KDE. This is part of um, Linux Mandrake. You probably have something like this, Ooh. which is a drop down at the login prompt of which desktop you want to start with. Let's just show you Enlightenment, because I want to show you how different it is from Windows. You know, some people who've only used Windows say it all has to look like Windows. It does not. This is the minimalist user interface. Notice we're getting a help pop up here just by leaving the mouse alone. If I right click, I'm going to get the settings menu. If I control left click, I'm going to get the menu. See, it's, there is no menu. It's just there. You have to control left, left click on the desktop. One of the things people like most about Enlightenment is this here. This is your, alter, your multiple desktops. If I, I'm going to open a couple of applications and show you how that, that might work. Let's open an amusement, a uh, open universe toy here, and then click another desktop and see how it slides off. It's over here. I just have, it's, I have a giant virtual desktop. In fact, I can even see here a wow. thumbnail of it which zooms in. Now, if I open another application here, you see it's a very nice way of organizing my, uh, my desktop. Let me just open up any, any other. I know, those are some scripts. Uh, there are, of course, completely skinnable on top of this. There we go. There's my applications. I don't know what it is, but I'm just going to open it just so I have something else. Now I can slide back and forth between the two, or I can click down here. I can even drag these around. I can move. I can reposition this window over here in this desktop. Now, this is just a minimalist desktop mm -hmm. that really gives you some flexibility. Let's log out here uh, real quickly. I'm going to show you some other. There are, there's more than one choice, obviously. In fact, if you install the full complement of Windows managers, you're going to get a ton of different choices right. in Linux Mandrake. I'm going to do uh, so it's more than just window colors and fancy wallpaper. Yeah, it is. In fact, you can do that on top of the manager. But the manager really is kind of the heart and soul. If you've ever, you, let's show you black box. This is, this is uh, even more minimalist. One of the things about this is if you have a slow system, a 486-based system, you can still run X really? with black box because it's so simple. Once again, pop-up windows. Uh, but there's nothing like these uh, virtual desktops, the pop-up menu here. And that's pretty much it. It's a minimalist user interface. You can go from application to application by clicking these context switch buttons, but it is as simple as possible. Uh -huh. Lean and mean runs well in almost any, uh, on any box that you can run X on. You should be able to run that window manager. And then real quickly, just because there are people who say, well, I'm not, whoops, don't look at that. <laughs> I'm not, too late. <laughs> Time to change all the passwords. I'm not going to, uh, oh, darn it, I didn't, um, nuts. I logged, it remembers, by the way, which one you logged into last time, so it remembers that I was in black box. If you want to use Linux and you don't want to learn a new user interface, just check, check KDE or GNOME. Both of those have very Windows-like. It says, don't run as root. I don't care. I'm going to run as root. <laughs> this is as about as Windows-like as you can get with basically a start menu, a taskbar down here. It makes it very simple and easy to understand. It even has a file browser that looks very much like Windows Explorer. So you're in, in many respects, uh, you're basically in a Windows environment. So you can use Linux in any flavor you want. Use it the way you want. Are all these installed na natively in Mandrake? Yeah, if you say on Mandrake, you have a checkbox that says Windows Managers. It'll install some basic set. Unless you say install all Windows Managers, then you get all of these different Windows Managers. Very cool. And it's, it's good to install them all. They're small, and they can do a lot for you. It's fun to find the one you like. Right. So many URLs, so many things to remember. By the way, thanks to Rasterman for doing a nice job with Enlightenment. He deserves some credit for that. All those desktops and more available at the screensavers. Dot com. We got a rush because Megan is dying to give us the quote of the day. I am. Today, Nick Hurd says, if you smile when something goes wrong, you already have someone else in mind to take the blame. Be sure to catch tomorrow's show. If you thought this was good, you're going to want to watch tomorrow. J.D. Frazen, the creator of Iliad, your favorite. Yay! <laughs> Talks why, about why hackers are so funny. Martin chats with President Bush's cyber security czar, Richard Clark. That should be interesting. Plus, become an amateur, amateur astronomer with your PC. We'll show you how to find the stars all on tomorrow's television program. It's going to be a good screen. It's pretty awesome screen. We had a good one tonight. I hope you, hope you saw the show. If you didn't, go watch it. It repeats again uh, in a couple hours. Watch it because you're going to love it. Do yourself a favor. Do yourself a favor. Geeky Grandma writes, I'm old, very old, even older than Leo. Ooh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Way back when I was in school and doing term papers, the subject matter that Martin talked about was not available on the importance of black American contributors to technology and geek culture. I want to thank him for some long-awaited information and the superlative way he's presented it. Marty, you hear that? Good job, Marty. Uh, and I hope you put that list up 
he did, there was a great list you sent to all of us of what life would be like in the United States if there had been no African Americans in it. There would be no skyscrapers because nobody would have been there to invent the elevator, things like that. Just fascinating. I wish you'd put that on the uh, internet or at least give us a link to it, Marty. Your turn. My turn. Here we go. You probably have the best information show ever. Love the... Well, I'm not even going to read that. That's... that's... Naughty. I'm thinking about upgrading my performance of my trusty old PowerWave 604 132 Mac clone with a G3 or G4 PCI upgrade card, or maybe a Sonic Crescendo G3 500 megahertz board or the G4 450 megahertz board. How would this upgrade compare to a real G3 of the same specs? How will it compare to my G3 PowerBook? Is it worth the upgrade? Upgrades are always a little bit slower because they're daughter boards. Right. It's better to get a new one if you can. Yeah, or even to get a maybe a slightly newer used system. Right. Uh, or even, you know what, if, you, if you're on a 604, depending on what you're trying to do or what kind of components you have to plug into if you got a lot of SCSI devices. Uh, it's a 604. Time to get a new one. Yeah, you know what? You can pick up used iMacs for nothing. That are 1800 bucks for the new iMac. It's an 800 point. megahertz G4. That's a great system. Yeah, we're going to use, you know, Blue G3 or a... Sure, there are a lot of those now. To be honest with you, the, you can upgrade the processor. You're probably better off either buying a new system or, or building a more and, expensive... And by upgrade. the way, you cannot run OS 10 on most upgraded processors. Hey, right. one thing I want to mention, we showed Maya. We didn't mention that it is available for... Macintosh OS 10 and Windows XP, or any flavor of NT, including Windows 2000. It might run an ME. Yeah. It's not certified for ME, but if you've got ME, you might give it a try. But certainly XP and uh, Windows, uh, I mean, OS 10. No, we're out of time. That's it for this edition of the Screen Savers. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Leo Laporte. We thank you so much for joining us, and thanks to our wonderful guests today, Burt Monroy and Andrew Pierce. Have a great evening. Take care, everybody.